You too? Uh, I am doing almost so so. Well, the situations over here aren't that good. Since I'm right now, I'm recording from home, and people outside are playing music, so there is some sort of disturbance. So I'm just hoping this goes well because I'm really looking forward for this interview. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this time, yeah. If you hear some children, it's because our kids are in the back, so we might have disturbances of both ends. Thank you for agreeing for this discussion. By the way, mm-hmm, our pleasure. So I would like to discuss about the study, the observations that you made, and what lies ahead to be discovered in this field. Mm-hmm. So, what prompted you and your interest in studying about this harm aversion? Well, we we are interested in in how so. Half of the lab works on human research and half on animal research, right? So the the main topic of the lab is really to try to discover the brain mechanism that uh, allow us to be empathic, basically. That's the main theme. So in particular, from the human research, what we are interested in is really trying to see whether uh, embodiment, so these processes that these uh, brain regions that become are reactivated when we see somebody else in pain, for instance. You know, the regions are normally involved in me being in pain that becomes also reactivated when you observe somebody else. Whether these, the activity of these regions is essential to uh, motivate us, for instance, not to hurt other people. And uh, one of the biggest limitations in particular of the human research is that you can go so far in understanding the brain mechanism because we cannot, we don't have uh, tools with the correct uh, resolution uh, in terms of, uh, for instance, understanding what a single cell does in these processes. And that's why for many years we developed, we try to develop a model in, in animals where all these techniques are, are more available that would allow us to investigate similar processes uh, um, to, to those in humans, so the processes basically that are involved in perceiving the other distress uh, also in animals. And uh, that's basically the main reasons why um, um, we moved towards this uh, research. And then we started from uh, coming up with experiments in which we simply measure the distress of an animal uh, in, in reaction to the distress of another which what we call emotional contagion, for instance, and we um, made it more and more complex uh, in order to reach slowly a degree of complexity that can be comparable to processes in humans. So emotional contagions, you can compare it, for instance, at the level of humans when you are in a crowd or when you're a baby, that as a crowd you are contagious by the emotions that are around. And uh, but then we wanted to go a little bit of a step forward. Okay, now I'm contagious. What does it mean to be contagious? Can I use this information to, for instance, avoid hurting other people? Um, and that's how we came about, more or less, of yeah. of this type of. I mean, uh, one one other motivation we have is that uh, in the past we have also been interested in people that seem to lack yeah. uh, the aversion to harming others. Uh, I mean, with that psychopath, sometimes they called sociopath as well. And so, uh, in a, a couple of years ago, we made a study in which we. Uh, identified psychopathic criminals in the high security institutions. We brought them to the lab and we uh, scanned their brains while they witnessed the pain of other individuals. And what we saw was that uh, if they don't have any particular reason to empathize with others, they really have reduced activity in their own pain regions while they witness the pain of others. So, of course, that's interesting and it may suggest that perhaps the reason why um, uh, if they can make some money, for instance, they don't mind to harm other people is because they don't activate their own pain much while they witness the pain of others. The problem, like Valeria was saying, is that in humans you can see that the brain region is active while you see the pain of others, 
but you can't easily change the activity in the brain region to see whether that would change the way that the psychopathic criminal would act. I mean, ideally, what we'd like to do is uh, increase the activity of these pain regions in psychopath and see that now suddenly they would uh, really care to, uh, to not harm others anymore. Although so what it's, we not could yet, do... it's also not yet very clear that we need the activity of these regions to avoid the arm, right? Now we are, that was the, and at that point, that's how we came about exactly. to run the experiment, because the first question was, is it really necessary, the activity of these regions? So you start with the idea, okay, I want to manipulate these regions to reduce psychopathy, but the field could not even prove that this, the activity was necessary. Uh, to reduce harm and so that was really one of the strong motivation behind the rodent experiment because in, um, rats have a very similar cingulate cortex to what humans have this is really a core part of the brain uh, that is involved in feeling your own pain so if you don't have a cingulate cortex and you hurt yourself you still feel that you cut yourself but you don't mind and so you're not going to do a lot to avoid being cut again. So this region exists also in the rat, and it's a relatively deep brain region. So therefore, we turn to the rat and figured in the rat, we can change the activity in that brain region and see whether that would then change how much a rat uh, would be averse to harming other rats or not. Could you briefly explain this study and its findings? Ah. <laughs> so, so a lot of results. Exactly. Just briefly. <laughs> so, so very briefly, what we do is uh, we give an, uh, a rat a choice between two levers that the rat can press. Both of these levers will provide uh, the rat with uh, one uh, little um, uh, pellet of sugar, which they really like. So they're, they're happy to press these levers to get uh, the reward. In the main experiment, what we do is that one of the two levers is a little bit more difficult to press than the other one. So most of the rats start to prefer the easy lever to, to press. Now, as soon as they've developed the preference for the easy lever, what we do is that now still both levers give one pellet of um, sucrose, but now the preferred, the easy lever, also gives a shock to a rat that's in the compartment next door. And so the, the rat that presses the lever, now suddenly here is someone next door kind of uh, protesting with a, with a pain squeak about the shock that he just got. And what we see is that uh, about uh, a little bit less than half of the rats we now stop to use their preferred lever because it gives a shock to the other one, and they would start to press the harder lever uh, to, uh, to avoid the shock to the other rat. Now, after we found that, what we could do is uh, go to the cingulate cortex, which is the region that we saw was uh, less active in the psychopathic criminal and is normally active when you feel the pain of other people. And what we saw was that when we deactivate this region with a Massimo, which is a bit like a local anesthetic that you can inject in that part of the brain, now suddenly the rats uh, continue to use their favorite lever, even when it harms another rat. So now what we see in there mainly are kind of two big findings. One is it shows us that humans are not the only animals that don't like to harm other animals. Rats also do that. And second is the fact that uh, they use the same brain region, which is the singular cortex that humans use uh, while they witness the pain of other people, as a necessary part of this harm aversion. And the fact that it's the same brain region that we see to be active in humans tells us that in a way, uh, it's not just the case that rats and humans have independently developed harm aversion. It suggests that there is kind of a common ancestor uh, that already had this uh, ability and that was then given to both the rats and the humans, which means that kind of harm aversion and not wanting to harm other people is at least 100 million years old, because that's more or less when we separated from 
uh, from rodents like rats and mice. And also what we see is that there is a variability in, in the responses mm. of the observers, of the rats that make the choice between the levers. And, uh, and maybe um, and, and, uh, these variability is also present in humans. When you do tasks that are a bit similar, you see that not everyone acts prosocially, preferring the prosocial lever, but you also have individuals that would go for the reward more often. So this is also another similarity between uh, uh, the animal work and the human work. And on top of that, I think that the other uh, things we learned from that experiment in, uh, is that it, um, the, the decision is a cost-benefit function, basically, because we have a condition, for instance, where we uh, increase the reward for the animal uh, from the, for the observer, and when you increase the reward, they are less willing to switch to the other lever. So uh, that's also another similarity mm. with the human work and shows that maybe the, the, it's a bit of a complex... A tipping point. Yeah, you have a tipping point and it is like a function that really weights the cost and the benefit uh, of that particular context. Because when, when uh, Valeria says that we increase the reward, uh, we increase the difference between the yeah. two levers. So in the main experiment, the only difference is that one is harder to press than the other, but they both give one pellet. Then in two other experiments, what we did was that now the two levers are equally hard to press, but one of them gives you two pellets, the other one does one pellet, and then rats are still willing to switch away from the two pellet to the one pellet to save the other one from pain. But when we made it three pallets versus one pallet, then uh, none of the rats uh, were willing to give up the three pallets to, to prevent uh, shock to the other person. Yeah, and then uh, the, the last, uh, I think, uh, uh, results I, I kind of like in a way is that uh, as in many human studies, also in the animal work, we did not find significant differences between sex. So both the, the, the female and the males act in a similar way. And that's also in this type of paradigms is also often the case in, uh, in, uh, in humans. Mm, that's true. So that's also interesting. Mm. What is the most fascinating aspect of this finding? Well, in a way I would say to really show, I mean, I always believed it any, that animal perform these choices too, and that they do to a certain extent at least care or at least perceive what goes on in the other, right? We can't maybe specifically speaking of voluntarily care about others, but at least they perceive what goes on. And, and I think this is something that the, the, the study shows pretty well, that, that they do perceive and that based on this perception, they, made a, they make a decision. And I think it's a complex uh, I mean, to me, it was a way, in a way trivial because I always believed that, you know, if you're a social, in, a social animal, whether you are a rat or a person, we are still animals, right? They, they must develop um, behaviors that um, take, ad, or take advantage or that they adapt to the fact that it's a social environment that involves more individuals. And um, but we didn't. I mean, the, the the fields keep discussing, right? Whether animals also have emotions, whether animals also can take this sort of decision, and to see slowly that uh, evidence accumulates in favor of processes uh, similar to what we call prosocial or emotion or uh, decision making. You know, similar, not exactly the same, but similar processes also uh, are present in animals. To me, sort of reassuring also. And, and it, it tells, and I think it, it allows us to learn from how evolution evolved as well. I mean, we are far from knowing exactly how it works, but we start having some models where we can think of, oh, evolutionary, maybe this process was already there, and then it de de developed further, more complex for the humans, but still it's there. Mm. Yeah, to a certain extent. Yeah, and I think the fact that it's really the same brain region uh, as well that seems to be involved kind of gives us uh, some confidence that uh, prosociality and caring about others is, uh, is really deeply ingrained in our biology. What technologies were used to conduct this study? 
Yeah, so in many ways, it's a, it's a relatively simple uh, study. Uh, so we, we didn't need to use anything very uh, high tech uh, in this case. Because to alter brain activity, we use uh, the injection of Massimo, which is a, a GABA-A blocker. It's a very simple pharmacological uh, agent. So it's really technologically a very simple study, nothing, nothing fancy. How did you get involved in this study? Oh, we, we, we brainstormed about it. We, we started... As I said, we did a lot of research on uh, since our early ages, let's say, all our car scientific career is based on embodiment and, uh, and the activity of these areas. And slowly we kept wondering more and more on the role of these areas. And then the way it goes, we normally speak about the topic and uh, include other people and keep brainstorming. And uh, I think that's how it goes, at least for us. And and in humans, we, we are also developing similar paradigms, so it just came one plus one equal two. <laughs> what were the roles of other people involved in the study? So, in, uh, so Yulen Hernandez uh, Lalmont, uh, the, the first author of the study, was, uh, was the one that basically made uh, the vast majority of the experiments. And uh, he was uh, helped by, uh, by, uh, by the, the other two, uh, Atta, uh, who, who did part of the, the other animal groups. And then uh, Cindy and uh, Eva helped to, to analyze the data. And basically, Valeria and me uh, have uh, kind of uh, helped design the study initially and uh, helped to, to analyze the data and write up the study. So we kind of lead the lab, but uh, the, uh, it's the other people that, uh, that really manipulate the rats and do all the hard work. What was the timeline of this study? Well, it was long. <laughs> yeah, I would say four years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah, because the behavioral part is the longest one because you need to understand the best way to teach the animal first to manipulate a lever, then to manipulate two levers, and then before the lever there is also another action that they need to do, and everything needs to be done within a certain time. So you need to let the animal to uh, the time to learn, and for, for you that you run the experiment, you need to learn what's the best way, how, what's the best way to teach them to do the, the task. Yeah. Yeah. That's uh, behavior uh, experiments on animals, they normally took quite some time to develop, mm. especially more complex ones. Mm. Which activity took the most time and attention? Yeah, I think like Valeria just said, uh, what's really important in these studies is to, to understand what kind of situation you can create for the rats that they really understand and in which they can uh, in a way, show you what they're capable of. So kind of fine-tuning uh, all, the, uh, all the elements of the task, kind of how long do you let the, the rats uh, develop a preference for one lever? Because if you give them too much time to get too used to one lever, they're not so willing to switch anymore. So and, uh, most of the time is really involved in in trying different versions of the paradigm, understanding what the, uh, what the rats really understand, and then analyzing all the, the, the behavior. What were the conditions did you test the hypothesis on? The switch, right? Was the... Yeah, exactly. So the, the, the three kind of conditions we looked at was the, a hard versus an easy lever, and then seeing whether they, they switch to the harder lever when, uh, to prevent the shock to the other one. Then we tried the two pallets versus one pallet, and then the three pallets versus one pallet. And then finally, to test really then, uh, whether the cingulate is necessary for that, we compare the condition in which we uh, inhibit the activity in the cingulate using Massimol against the condition where we just inject uh, 
uh, salt water into the same brain region, which doesn't have any effect. So you mentioned the study took four years. So you started back in 2016? Correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah more or less. I don't remember yeah. the date. What was the most difficult part of the study in these four years? I think it was really, again, the be establishing the behavior. And in particular, because we, at first, so the, the, the paradigm itself, uh, we took it from a previous study that was uh, run years years ago, do you remember? Yeah, in 69, so that's kind of 50 years ago. 50 years ago, so the idea of the two levels. And, uh, it, so, and at that time, in point, also the level of details were not so many. It's not, the, the, the paradigms, was, it's, where the articles were not... Uh, giving as much as information as we now have to uh, uh, to write down, and so we had to guess some parameters over there, and um, and the fact that the rat would prefer the easy lever was also not so straightforward. So we thought, oh, they're gonna e prefer the easy lever, and that's it. But at the end, you know, some rats, uh, some animals uh, develop a preference on the side, like. They prefer the right lever or the left right lever, or others they prefer the heavy lever, yeah. right? And and uh, that was also a bit puzzling at first. We thought, okay, what do we do with the fact that a couple of rats prefer the hard lever? Is that meaningful uh, yeah. or, or not? So we had to discuss a lot how to adapt the paradigm to make it working. And this is also why we came about in uh, using this switching index because. For our purposes, purposes at the end, as long as the rat is able to switch a preference, right? To uh, whatever preference is developed is irrelevant, right? And before, at the beginning of the study, we were more thinking, oh, they have to develop the preference for the easy lever, yeah. and and that was bringing us a bit uh, out of the of the uh, of the main purpose. And then we realized, okay, but. What which preference they develop at yeah, the end, exactly. it doesn't matter as long as we have a preference that we we can show that can change because of the shock. So I think this was one of the mm. longest part, I would say. Uh, yes. Yeah, and also yeah, I would uh, no, I would definitely say that. Mm. Mm. Were you anticipating this outcome? Yes. Yeah, I would say yes. For yeah. once. <laughs> yeah, for once, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what? yeah, there was some some evidence uh, around and a previous work was already bringing us towards that direction. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we, we could not anticipate the proportion of animals that they would switch, but for sure we were expecting the rats to switch. to switch. And we were hoping for the singular to be necessary, yeah. so... So what was your first reaction after confirming the hypothesis? And sorry, I didn't hear that. What was your first reaction after confirming the hypothesis was true? Uh, jubilation. <laughs> we were happy. Yeah. How many rats were used, roughly speaking, for this study? Uh, I think in, it's written in the paper, but my guess would be something like, uh, let's say, 70. I don't remember. I should check. How distantly were the rats related to each other? I yeah, so, so that's interesting. In this study, we really find that there is a lot of variability between the rats. So, like I was mentioning, we have uh, about 40% that will really switch when they witness the other one getting shocked, and about 60% that do not switch. Yep. So, as a group, we really see that they do switch, but then uh, only a proportion of the individuals really show that sensitivity, and others do not. Or, or did you mean how close they were in terms of familiarity? I meant in kinship, how genetically close, like... Ah, okay, yeah, 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 then you were right. <laughs> so, so we had... Uh, in, in, so they're not, in, 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 they're not genetically related, they're not brothers or sisters, 
And what we have is we have, uh, we made uh, one of the experiments with rats that uh, didn't meet uh, each other before, and uh, it works. And we had other cases in which they were living in the same home cage, and so therefore knew each other very well, and the effect was not stronger. So amongst uh, our rats, we we really noticed that they care even uh, about uh, the fate of a, of a stranger. So there was, is it fair to say there was no change in the degree of harm aversion when the actor and the victim were mates? Correct. Well, mates uh, yeah. as in cage mates. Yeah, we, we, uh, there was no sign of a difference. But we didn't test it properly. Well, right? we do have, uh, we did uh, look okay. at it uh, and it wasn't, it's not the perfect comparison because uh, the two groups were slightly different in the paradigm as well, but uh, it didn't look like there was a big difference. So do you think the degree of harm aversion would have been greater if the actor victim shared some sort of kinship? So we, we're actually uh, going to, to test that uh, very soon, and uh, we, uh, it, it's up for grabs. But uh, what we, in the past, we've looked at whether uh, a rat shows more freezing when it sees another one get a shock, which is a form of emotional contagion. And there we, we compared a kind of uh, rats from different strains even. So one of the albino rats against uh, a black and white rat versus uh, that had never seen each other before or ever seen even a member of that strain. The one end and on the other end, really rats that had spent five weeks together and knew each other very well. And we didn't see any difference there. So kind of, uh, I think the most robust finding is really that they care even uh, about what happens to a stranger. Yeah. But yeah, we are testing it again now in the, fu in the future. Exactly. Specifically like whether, uh, whether a mother would do more for her own kids than, uh, than for, uh, for... Kids of somebody else. Yeah. Well, that would go on to support Richard Dawkins, the selfish gene. Correct. Yeah. Correct. How was the functioning of anterior cingulate cortex deactivated in the rats? How exactly did that work? Yes, what you do is you, uh, you place an, a cannula, uh, so you, you put the animal in a stereotype, which is a system where you can uh, go to a very specific position in the brain. We place the cannula, which is like an injection needle, uh, just uh, where we know the cingulate to be. Uh, then you let the animal recover with the cannula cemented in place. And then on the day of the experiment, you, uh, you basically inject a little bit of Massimo, which is an, uh, an agent that blocks neurotransmission. Uh, and, um, uh, by doing that, you can reduce the activity of the cingulate for about one hour. And then during that hour, you can make the experiment. And then the control group is the same thing, but instead of injecting the massimol, you inject uh, some salt water. And in, did you ask about the function? No? Oh, no. Did you ask about the function of the deactivation or? What, what, what was the question? How was the functioning of the singulate uh, deactivated using the chemical? That is what I wanted. What are the effects of the massimol on the rat's body other than deactivating the singulate? Uh, sorry, I didn't quite understand the question. What, what are the effects of massimol on the rat's body other than deactivating the singulate? Uh, nothing really, because you inject a very small quantity that should only spread about one millimeter in the brain. So it really just affects the, the region that you, and you don't see any change in behavior. So we also tested 
for instance, whether they moved more or less, whether they pressed the levers quicker or slower, yeah. and there was no difference. The only difference is that they didn't learn to not press the one that chokes the other. And for instance, if you, when you inject with Musimol in the ACC during a normal fear conditioning paradigm, so where the, you associate the shock to a sound and then you present the sound, in that case, the rat behaves normally and it still freezes. So it, it, it does suggest that the, mu the musimol effect is not impairing the normal behavior, but specifically impairs the social uh, behavior yeah. of or the, the feeling, uh, the you feeling. Have for others. Exactly. And that was also the, the interesting, I mean, it's also the interesting part of the, the ACC that we believe to contribute really to, to including the other into your decision making. Because for a normal field conditioning paradigms, you don't need to go through the ACC. The amygdala seems to be self-sufficient. Uh, but if you do a field conditioning, basically, that involves another individual, uh, instead of uh, a Your sound pain. like uh, a pain, then you, you do need to go the, 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 uh, the contribution of the ACC. So there seems to be two slightly uh, complementary pathway for fear detection. After the effect of deactivating the ACC wore off, was the degree of harm aversion of the actors back to the previously observed level? Yeah, that we uh, we didn't measure. So in that study, uh, the uh, the Massimo animals were only in uh, the behavior with the ACC deactivated, and the other ones were only with their ACC intact. So, uh, but this is something that we plan to to test in the future as well, to to really see whether the ACC is necessary to acquire the uh, the aversion versus to maintain it. Okay. So it is not a permanent loss of empathy, right? We, we don't know, but uh, I mean, there's no, uh, so I think there's no reason to assume that when uh, the Massimo wears off, they, they would not become normal again, right? So that is, uh, uh, that's most likely. What we don't know is whether um, if we had, for instance, because there's three days of experiment, right, uh, where they developed uh, an, uh, uh, the, the aversion. And uh, what we didn't try is, for instance, give Massimo on day one and on day two, and then stop it on day three, and see whether on day three they would then suddenly develop uh, a kind of uh, stop using the lever that gave shocks on the other days. So that we don't know whether it's necessary for learning or for recall. We just know that uh, if you don't have it at all, you don't learn at all. Did any of the actor rats choose to switch when they were on uh, Massimol and their and ACC was deactivated? Did any one of them switch? Uh, I don't, uh, that's a good question that I would need to look in the paper. If you have the, the paper there, perhaps you can see it. But uh, I, uh, I can have a quick look to see if I have the paper somewhere. Uh, corrected proofs. And the Massimo figure is this one. Uh, yes, so if you look at the, at the figure, uh, what figure number is the figure 4C, you can see the, the behavior of each individual animal. And what you what you will notice is that there are some animals like the uh, some of the red animals, which are in the Massimo group, that did switch, but the majority didn't switch. So I see there's one and only one animal in the Massimo group that really uh, did switch. 
But uh, so that's uh, no, what, what happens is that when you make those uh, experiments, you never know for sure that when you inject uh, the Massimo, uh, that it uh, has the desired effect. Because, uh, of course, you, you have a cannula that's in the brain, and the cannula could uh, become clogged or so. No, wait a second. Deny. Whoops. That's not what I wanted to do. Ah, okay. I'll see you again. Uh, so, no, so it can be that that one animal switched because uh, the Massimo wasn't effective for some reason. Did the team test the change in the degree of harm aversion when the actorettes were given psychoactive drugs? Okay. No. No. Could be nice, but we didn't. Exactly. Yeah, no, in particular, uh, there's uh, a drug called ecstasy that, uh, that you may have heard of. So some people report that ecstasy, for instance, increases uh, the feeling of, of empathy uh, amongst humans. And I think that there is uh, somewhere a study suggesting that if you give that to an animal, there is also an increase uh, in the sensitivity to, uh, uh, to what uh, happens in another animal. But we didn't test that. Did you also conduct the test with only one lever delivering the food, also the electric shocks? How far were the rats willing to starve before they chose the victim should suffer? Yeah, no, so we didn't do that. It is a very old experiment uh, from church. And uh, I think in the 50s, he did that experiment kind of with the rats and with monkeys. And he sees that the rats uh, will use the lever less. Uh, so even if you just have one lever, they'll use it less if it causes pain to others. Um, but uh, in, it, uh, in monkeys, there was a, a very strong effect. So some of the monkeys really uh, would rather not eat anything than to shock uh, another monkey. So it's an interesting experiment, but we haven't done it. The study mentioned there were sub. Uh, I this is figure number. Just give me a second. Mm -hmm. The figure that I'm re referring to is on. This is which page? Just a second. On page number five, the second one. I can't see the name. So you, so you had mentioned that in the study it was mentioned the ind individual differences in the switching across the rats. Yes. At various degrees. So. What percentage of the rats showed reduced level of harm aversion after being subject to the electric shocks? Because in that diagram, we can clearly see the difference between the contingent harm of males is lesser as compared to the females, even I, though it is what similar. Uh, so which, uh, which panel of the figure do you mean? So you mean figure three, right? Individual variability. Uh, on figure S, I uh, figure two, figure two B. Okay, what figure two B? Yeah, well, no. So what you see here is uh, so the two lines, the, uh, the the dark green and the light green that represents the the males and the females. And what you know, the harm aversion, for that you should look at how much it changes from the baseline to the, to the three shock sessions. And the, the change is exactly the same in males and females. What the, the difference between the two curves that you see 
is the fact that the, the females started off with a higher preference uh, than the males did, but then uh, the, the reduction in preference is the same across groups. Okay. Tell us more about the observed differences between these rats of how various degrees of individual differences existed between these rats. Between which rats? Uh, rats in, you mean in general in the experiment? In general, like the rats which were on the extremes, how extreme were they on the case by case basis? Well, so that you can see if you look at figure 3b in particular, you can okay. really see that the, 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 there are some examples on the top of 3b of, uh, of rats that had uh, started off with a very strong preference. So they were around 100 on the baseline session and they just stayed uh, at 100. Yeah. So, in the, so they in the absolutely didn't care at all. And then uh, on, in the other case, uh, if you look at the bottom panel, you have some animals that uh, initially had a preference in, uh, around uh, kind of uh, 80%, and by day three, they really go down to 0% of the shock level use. So uh, it's really a very substantial difference. Uh, yeah. Some change as much as they possibly could, and some don't change at all. What could be the possible reason for this? Yeah, so it's a good, uh, yeah. we, uh, if we knew that, we, we would be very happy. So and, uh, I think, so the things we did look at in, uh, and that didn't uh, play a major difference is actually the reaction of the demonstrator. So the first thing we figured, perhaps uh, you have demonstrators that really squeak a lot and others that don't give a lot of pain signals, and that could explain the difference. But when we quantified the reaction of the demonstrators, we saw that there were no major differences there. Uh, where we did see really big differences is in uh, the reaction of the, the observer. Uh, so, uh, so we saw that uh, some observers, for instance, when they, uh, when they realized that they had shocked the other one, they really stopped to do anything for a while and, and, and took longer to go get their food and ate the food very quickly. So they really showed that they were, uh, that they were disturbed by the shocks and those were the ones that switched. And then there were other rats that uh, didn't seem to, to mind at all. They just kept eating their food as if nothing had happened. And those ones were the ones that didn't switch. So. Uh, we, we feel that there's really just an, uh, a striking difference in how much attention as well the, uh, the agents paid to the uh, harm signals of, of the other person. But the causes are not known. Not the exactly. causes of this difference are not known. It could, could be different activity, brain activity. It could be uh, the relationship between the distress that, that, you, that the uh, observer perceives from the other that stops him to... Uh, do anything or actually motivates the other. I mean, there are a lot of factors that could play a role and we are trying to think of ex how to test and disentangle these aspects apart, but it's not, uh, it's not easy, but it's uh, no, okay. definitely a topic we're interested, interested in. Yeah. How much do we know about the evolution of harm aversion? Yeah, well, we in a, we don't know that much. So, so kind of also from a, in a from a kind of biological point of view, kind of it's only over the past I would say 10, 20 years that the evolutionary biology is really paying a lot of attention to uh, uh, to kind of altruism and mutualism. Because if you read kind of in, in, a traditional and evolutionary kind of uh, books, they underline the selfishness of individuals. So the idea that you, you mainly need to survive yourself and that other animals are really competitors. And then more slowly people started to say, well, of course you care about your kids because they have a lot of your genes and therefore that makes sense. 
And it's only in, uh, quite recently that people start to really see that even if you're not related to another animal, but kind of you help each other, uh, you're in a, the, the whole kind of uh, in a group ends up better off and uh, the individual ends up being better off because often rats actually or, or animals have a sense of mutualism. So if someone was kind to you at some point, you're more likely to, uh, in, uh, to be helped by that person in the future. So that helping others is a way to facilitate being helped by them in the in the future, and so it's a, it still is a, a relatively young field of research that really acknowledges the fact that uh, kind of in social animals that live in groups, and uh, individuals will really do things for others, kind of, and that this is uh, beneficial in evolution. So it's uh, it's really only starting to to be explored. Is the ACC responsible for harm aversion in other vertebrates too? Mm. Yeah. So what we know is that, for instance, in monkeys, the the cingulate seems to be necessary as well to, for instance, um, decide to work to give juice to someone else. So in the primates, they have some paradigms where um, uh, you see a symbol on the screen. That means that if you now do something, they can be juice for yourself. And a different signal uh, symbol, if you work, will give juice to another monkey. And a third symbol, if you work on that one, there'll be juice just delivered in an empty glass. And what you see is that monkeys, uh, really work hard for themselves, but they're also willing to work a little bit to give juice to another monkey. And it's more than what they're willing to work if the juice is just going to get wasted in a glass. And uh, there as well, the ACC seems to be important to motivate uh, the monkey to, to work for another monkey. And uh, that's uh, the, the other example that we know Kind of uh, in uh, in mice, there is some uh, some evidence that if you disrupt the cingulate, then uh, a rat a mouse will no longer freeze when they see another one getting shocks. But that's uh, that's it. As far as I know, there's no other animal that has been explored. Are there any ethical considerations around conducting the study? Yes, of course. So, I mean, we, we ourselves, of course, do not particularly like to, uh, to, to have to give shocks uh, to, to one animal. So we, the, the only reason we really do these experiments is that we feel that uh, harm aversion is such an important phenomenon because in human society, when people lack harm aversion, they really cause a lot of damage to, to society, both because they harm people, then they end up in prison, and that has a huge cost. But as well for the fact that these individuals really erode trust, and then uh, they're in, uh, they harm in a way the interaction that all of us have with each other, because we're always afraid that the person we have in front of us might be someone that will take advantage of you and, and harm you. So I think that understanding how that works in the brain is really, really important. And because of that, we may feel that it's, uh, it's, uh, it's important to really understand how it works. And currently, uh, working with animals is the only way that we can really uh, modify brain activity and see if it changes behavior. In future, might you test this hypothesis with different species? Yes, so we might do it in mice. So, of course, for a lot of people, rats and mice are pretty much the same thing, but uh, kind of uh, they, there is a difference between them. Yeah. And uh, ultimately, we hope that we can do this in, in humans. humans. But uh, for, for that, we need techniques in which we can... Uh, well, we are modify doing... brain activity in deeper brain regions. Yeah, exactly. So we, you can do it once in a while in patients that already that suffer of, of epilepsy, 
and normally you can and then the the surgeons uh, insert electrodes to measure to try to find out the source of epilepsy and you can at times stimulate to see whether the region is essential in some of the normal behavior so at times you can have access to these patients and ask them to participate in our task and uh, we have a couple of collaborations and uh, that we hope they will help us to uh, to tell something more about the the role of the ACC and the insula in this type of uh, tasks and uh, we are also currently trying to develop methods uh, that are uh, human friendly in the sense that they are not invasive um, and to be used in healthy participants to try to disrupt the activity of these regions as well that nowadays it's not easy to do because the TMS and uh, that normally used to stimulate brain in humans, the transcranial uh, man magnetic stimulation, doesn't, it's not very well suited to reach deeper structure. Like the ACC goes really inside and it's a bit uh, cur curved as well. So it's not, you can reach it with TMS, but it's not the cleanest way. So we are also trying to see whether we can use, for instance, ultrasound stimulation to, to do it and test it directly in humans. Of course, you can also make use of data that comes from patients that had strokes or damages in the ACC. And there was a study from uh, Ralph Adolfs in the past that did confirm that uh, some of the of these regions, like the insula, for instance, uh, are important and essential for discriminating emotion, for instance. So we, uh, you can also uh, test in these patients, use our task and test these patients. Mm -hmm. So there are a bit some ways to to do it in humans, but uh, it's quite small. So we are investing, but uh, the results take longer. And of course, when you use patients, you always have the problem of reorganization of the brain structure that you are looking at, uh, possibly. So is there a way to increase the degree of harm aversion in antisocial beings? Yeah, that's that's the question we are really interested in, and we don't know, and that's why we are interested in finding out whether a particular region like the ACC is necessary for the development or, or for the behavior to occur, because once we know and we can confirm that in humans as well, what you could think are several ways. You can manipulate plasticity in that region, so uh, ask the participants to go through certain tasks where they learn something and why you are modifying, for instance, the plasticity of the brain with the, the, the with current or magnetic stimulation. Or you can think of targeted um, therapies, for instance, like neurofeedback, where you project the activity of the areas when the participant is doing a task and, and the participants can directly modify uh, through visual feedback, the activity of these areas coming up. Uh, uh, so you, you, if I now project on the screen the activity uh, real time, the activity of a particular regions, I can tell you, okay, try to find a ways to modify that region. So you would come up with thinking of something, you know, it, it's just a random uh, uh, process, but you could come up uh, with a task saying like, okay, if I think of uh, how my friend uh, is feeling now, I see that I manipulate that region. And then you can practice and practice to the point that then it becomes an automatic uh, kind of things and that the activity of that region now is um, modified based on your exercise and, and your automatism. So there are ways that we hope we will be able to use in the future to see whether we can use, uh, we can indeed in, improve uh, or help these people to care more about. Uh, but again, we need to identify not just the, re the, the, the regions that is involved, but also at what point of the decision making is happening. So is it the motivation that is lacking? Is just the uh, uh, attention or is the general level of the activity of that area? I mean, we don't know yet what is the reason why uh, harm is done or, or you don't have the, the care to the other. And, it, and if you consider that these decisions are always or in most of the cases, this balance between a cost and a benefit, what you need to do is really to readjust the cost-benefit balance, which complicates the thing a little bit more. 
but that is the way we want to go, but it's a future mm -hmm. uh, work. Are and there also, any you also, sorry, but you also have this ethical aspect, like, so it depends what, if uh, somebody like with psychopathy is just in the tail of the normal distribution, like, so it's not just a specific uh, dysfunction, but it's just a normal variability that you went to the extreme, right? Then where would you put the line and say, okay, now I intervene to change these and when I don't, because we know that certain traits or certain aspects of psychopathy can be quite useful in society as well. So then it becomes a, another ethical problem or where, when do we actually intervene? Uh, and uh, do we want to intervene early in kids that already manifest aggressive behavior or do we need to let them experience it and then act later on? So there are co a lot of considerations before doing interventions on, on these topics, I would say. Are there any future plans to explore more on the harm aversion and its evolution? Uh, yes, there are a lot of plans in any in the route, let's say. Uh, one of the plans we have is to really understand a little bit uh, even more in, de in details what is happening in the brain. So at the real, at the cellular level, and which are the inputs of the uh, of these neurons that are involved, what type of neurons are involved, and all these uh, aspects. We are also interested in uh, in trying in the understand in the developmental curve uh, what is happening. Uh, for instance, if you are exposed to a very stressful life when you are young what kind of consequence has this on harm aversion later in life. And we are interested in seeing how it is uh, also uh, transmitted through generations. Like if you have these variabilities between individuals, uh, with some individuals having higher propensity to be prosocial, or whether you, you, know, you select individuals that are mostly prosocial, would this selection be brought forward in the next uh, generation? So we want also to see how much is learned and how much is more genetically encoded. Um, so all these aspects we are trying to tackle with different experiments. Uh, and let's hope we, I'm curious about the results, but we are very early at this, at this stage. What are the other research you are currently working on? Uh, <laughs> do you want them all? <laughs> no, okay. Uh, <laughs> um, so as I mentioned, in, in from the animal's point of view, we are doing, we want to do electrophysiology on the, a bit more of electrophysiology and optogenetic uh, into the, to discover the role of the ACC and the, the each single cell of the ACC, as I was mentioning before. So, um, is it, for instance, uh, let's say, um, what, what type of cells is involved in, uh, in mapping my pain, the other pain into my own pain, and uh, where the information comes from? So what is the circuit that is involved and how the areas exchange information? Uh, this is one aspect uh, of one of the experiments we're going to run. In humans, for instance, we are also we have been implementing uh, a lot of learning paradigms similar to the one in this paper, where people are faced with two symbols. They have to understand what are the consequences of choosing one versus the other, and one symbol most often most often brings you a higher reward, monetary reward, but also you would see the other being more in pain and the other symbol is the opposite. And we again want to understand whether the circuits that is involved is the same that we see in the animal and vice versa. And, uh, and again, whether we would like to stimulate some of the areas we find to see uh, how uh, the, the, the causality between the, this particular brain activity and the behavior and uh, we are also curious to see whether it matters, whether you see the other person uh, being in pain in front of you, for instance, compared to simply receiving a message that the other person is in pain. Um, uh, because we believe that the embodiment component mainly comes into play when you see the, the other person. Uh, you can also recall some embodiment processes through text. Uh, but whether there is a difference between the two, we don't know. So we are also interested in, this, in that aspect and also interested in the differentiating whether 
when you have uh, when you encounter such a type of conflict where there is the a negative consequence like pain versus money versus a reward whether you value the pain of the other similarly to how much you value the pain for yourself and this is just a, a glimpse on all the things we are doing i would say on this aspect we are also um yeah, interested, and we have experiments that are trying to see how we cells uh, encode emotions. Like, for instance, do we map? Do we have uh, cells that code for for happiness and cells that code for pain, painfulness, or sadness, or the cells is simply encoding uh, the, uh, like the negative and positive aspect towards uh, how strong it is independently of a specific emotions. So these are also other questions we have. Mm. And I don't know if you want to mention no, more, I but I think yeah. it's plenty. But yeah. 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 What is your role at the Netherlands Institute of ne Neuroscience? Yeah, so we, in, uh, we basically are in uh, both of us uh, department heads. So that means that we, uh, we, we each have a a group of people that we uh, basically manage and uh, of course we we really work very very closely together so our two groups uh, kind of together form what we call the social brain lab which is uh, which is basically investigating uh, how our brain processes the, the emotions of others and reacts to them but that were all the questions i had for you both okay very good is there something you would like to add? Well, no, I think you. it was quite uh, it thorough. Quite thoroughly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much for yeah. agreeing for this. It was yeah. a great pleasure discussing this with you. Thank <laughs> You're you. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.